Welcome to Law and Justice. My name is Jane Malkahi, and this is a special series on the topic of how to talk policy and influence people. Today, I'm really thrilled to be joined by Superintendent Stan Gilmore uh, from the Thames Valley Police in the UK. Hi, Stan. How are you? Hi, Jane. I'm very, very well, thank you. Thank you very much for joining me, Stan. Um, maybe before we kind of get into discussing crime and violence and violence reduction units, you can tell me a little bit about yourself and your, your background and your policing experience, please, Stan. Okay, well, I'm a, a police officer in the UK with Thames Valley Police. Uh, Thames Valley Police cover the three counties of Buckinghamshire, Berkshire and Oxfordshire. Uh, I've been a police officer for nearly 30 years now. Uh, and in those kind of decades, I've covered a wide range of policing from frontline response, neighbourhood policing to armed policing and latterly investigation. Um, and I've worked in homicide teams. I've worked in counterterrorism. I've worked in organised crime. Uh, I've led frontline policing as a, an operational police commander for Reading. Uh, and now I'm uh, I'm heading up the Thames Valley Violence Reduction Unit as their director. Smashing! That's a very uh, wide and varied career for sure in policing, Stan. And so I know you from Twitter, and we've met briefly in real life yes. as well. And uh, yep. we're we're, we're um, part of the Neurodiversity Special Interest Group on Leffa. Um, can you tell me, how did you become interested in, in adverse childhood experiences and trauma? Okay. Um, well, I think like many police officers, I, I spent a lot of my career leaving homes thinking, my, my goodness, those children have really got it tough. Um, and then as you kind of progress through your career, you start to see those children uh, as they grow up getting involved in, in crime and antisocial behaviour. And, you know, to, uh, in your heart, you think, well, I'm, I'm not surprised, you know, they've, they've kind of grown up in that environment. Um, so it wasn't really until 2015 when I went to a conference that the, the whole topic of adverse childhood experiences and the science behind it was introduced to me. And I thought, well, I didn't know people were, <laughs> were researching this stuff. That's really interesting. And, uh, you know, I kind of had in, in my head that people who you know, had a tough life had more um, more chance of falling into crime, both as victims and offenders. But I didn't realise the health impact um, or the science behind the, the brain development that, that kind of explained it. I took probably a much more sociological perspective mm -hmm. that it was it was their environment. And, and actually, it wasn't until 2015 I realised that that this trauma caused physical changes in the way that they developed um, and the way that their brain developed. And, and then I started researching it and I realized that actually, when you look at the kind of key risks associated to uh, you know, lifetime offending, many of them track back to trauma mm -hmm. uh, and to the things that trauma does to your brain and therefore the choices that are made often for you, but often by you. Uh, that can lead into developing other risks. So, it, it, you know, when you're looking, I've spent a lot of time as well doing organisational development and organisational reviews. Uh, and when you're looking for root causes uh, in, you know, why organisational systems are perhaps not optimum, mm -hmm. if you use the same thinking around, well, why social systems aren't, then it, it takes you back to those root causes many of them steeped in trauma uh, within uh, within systems that uh, that produce and reproduce inequality in a broader sense as well. So probably for the last five years, I've, I've developed an interest in it and, and a research interest in it as well, because I I do research and I do publish. Um, and, you know, this is uh, this is something that I'm hoping to do with this topic at some point. Thanks, Stan. And you mentioned there that you you previously had more of a sociological understanding. I think that's very common um, for, for most, if not all of us who are interested in crime, because anyone, yeah. particularly at the front lines, you're going into particular neighborhoods more than yeah. other ones, the poor yes. neighborhoods with yes. um, you know, unemployment, 
more yes. lone parent families, um, intergenerational educational disadvantage. So we all kind of knew that, but I think it's yeah. the fact that um, childhood adversity and trauma is also more common in those communities and that there's only so many maybe stressors that we can handle, particularly if we don't have supportive relationships before we um, get ourselves into some sort of maybe social trouble or addiction or mental health issues. But Stan, in terms of applying then that information to your approach to policing, do you think something has changed for you since you've, you know, had this information and understood about neural development and that type of thing? Yes, well, I've, I've always been interested in problem solving um, and problem solving policing. Um, and we're living in interesting times, aren't we? <laughs> it's a bit, bit of a curse, really. But, um, you know, the, the much of the literature around policing from the 70s is really relevant now. Um, you know, Morris Punch wrote about the police as the secret social service, um, you know, 30 odd years ago. Uh, and, you know, the research predates that as well. Uh, but policing has a role to play in, in wider community safety and the health and well-being of our communities. And I think it's been captured in the last um, decade or so by a strong voice that argues that policing is about law enforcement only. Uh, and of course, it isn't. It never has been and it wasn't designed to be. Um, and I think we've fallen into a bit of a rabbit hole, really, around viewing policing just as law enforcement. Um, so I, I take the view that policing is about wider community safety. We have a role to play with our partners and with our communities in developing um, our communities, helping our communities to develop, to be more safe and secure, to reduce inequalities, to improve life chances. Now, when you take that perspective on your role in the police, there is clearly a key central element that the police are there to enforce the law. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, when you when you say how you do that is really important mm. in a problem solving context, then you start to design systems where law enforcement um, is a central pillar, but it, it is at the center of, you know, a range of pillars uh, that you must work with and between in order to make things better, uh, because you can quite easily make things worse. That, that's right. And one of the things that I've learned um, about trauma and adversity um, and attachment is that, you know, we need functional, healthy relationships to not only survive, but to thrive. And that many yes. of our systems are relationally a bit abusive in and of themselves. And then things like community policing, it's essentially a relational endeavor. So do you think, uh, and, and, and in terms of crime prevention, maybe understanding that a family is under chronic strain and maybe the mother is experiencing domestic violence and mental health issues and hence children might be neglected or something else might be going on. Do you think that helps in terms of approaching um, interactions as a frontline police officer yes. potentially differently? Yeah, yes, it absolutely does. Um, if you understand trauma, then uh, you're much more able not only to understand your own emotional response to things, but to understand why people are reacting the way they are within the situation that you're dealing with. And, you know, police officers go into the most horrendous situations and have to make sense of it, um, only to have their decisions made under extreme trauma you know, unpicked and scrutinized by, you know, teams of people for years later. So the more tools you can give police officers when they enter a situation to understand what's happening, not just, you know, physically, but perhaps in the head of those that are, are present, then the better because you can begin to uh, make decisions, even if you can't form a relationship in that time. And that's very difficult. Yes. Um, but at least you can make decisions that don't re-traumatize, that do, that do help you understand actually what's going on. You know, and I think the case in point here, and there are others, but the case in point is child sexual exploitation, where, you know, for a very long time, the police and, frankly, everyone else, um, you know, did not see what was happening because of the behavior of those victims involved in the scenario. 
you know, they were aggressive, they were uncooperative, they were lying, you know, whatever assumptions people came to because of the behavior they were seeing, and it was taught as well as learned behavior. Um, they just didn't understand that actually this is a trauma response and we need to think differently about it. When that started happening, we started seeing what was going on. Laws and policies changed and we began to help those victims. Um, and there are many other scenarios where similar things are still happening because of those kind of institutionalized assumptions that are made about you know, good and bad, right and wrong, mm. uh, and the way be people behave. And there's a classic around, you know, is somebody lying to you? I've heard so many people say, oh, I can tell when somebody's lying. And of course, the tomes of research would put, would, would, would put that slightly differently, I think. You know, it's a toss of a coin as to whether you can tell whether somebody's lying or not. You can generally tell with a sliver of more certainty whether somebody's telling the truth. And the only reason you can do that is because we as social animals are programmed to, to believe people. Um, so when somebody says, oh, I, I, you know, the cues that you pick up for lying, you know, no eye contact, evasive, um, you know, stories, patchy, changes over time, you know, aggressive when pushed on a, on a, a point of, of kind of factual information. That, that's all a trauma response, you know, and, and where people, you know, are um, learned to kind of spot when folks are lying, it's exactly the same um, behavior when they're suffering from, you know, trauma. Um, so just believing people, checking the facts, of course, but um, at least uh, not writing them off at first contact, uh, you know, allows you to gain better evidence and and two in uh, you know in longer terms to provide the basis for a relationship um, and that's good for everyone yeah that's that's such a great point about uh, the assumptions that the whole system really has about um rational choice i guess and <laughs> yeah. that we're in complete control all the time of yeah. our answers, of our memory, of our narratives, yeah. when yeah. definitely even the most cursory understanding of trauma turns all that on its head. Yes. But as you also mentioned there, police see and hear and get involved by nature of their job in very traumatic incidences themselves. They're drawn into them whether they want to be or not. Yes. And that takes a toll on individuals too. Yeah. Um, and maybe maybe they have some of their own survival responses or they're pulled out of their thinking brain and into their survival brain and uh, respond too quickly in, in an aggressive fashion. Do you think our systems need to understand survival responses and trauma as well in order sometimes to understand the poor behaviors or, or irrational responses of, of frontline officers? and? And do people yeah. need to understand their own coping strategies maybe when they see awful things? Yes. <laughs> yes, they do. Um, I mean, it's taught in many scenarios. You know, when, you know, in, in, when I was in armed policing, we were taught very clearly what happens to your body when you're under stress and how your hearing and vision and uh, you know, everything else shuts down as you're in your own fight or flight. You know, it's mm -hmm. uh, even if you're a professional and you feel under control, you're, you're you know, your body, uh, you know, takes over um, and it keeps the score as, uh, as the great book says. So, uh, you know, as you go from tra traumatic incident to traumatic incident, those things add up and layer. And, you know, frontline policing can be a very physical job and, you know, low level physical trauma has its impact on your ability to recover from emotional trauma. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's, there's, hugely interlayered reasons why everyone needs to understand that you know dealing with you know human human reactions is uh, is fraught uh, and we need to give each other a bit of space uh, and a bit of understanding to uh, realize the impact it's having not just on those that we're working with but on on each other and in the UK, is trauma training kind of mainstreamed for for police officers at every level? No, um, no. Uh, this is a this is a fairly you know new and developing field, um, 
and you know there are uh, police forces in the UK that have done more, and there's others that have done less. Uh, there's no you know clear national program. There are there are national health and well-being programs that have this at the centre of it, but um, I think we're still uh, working through. Uh, what a kind of national program might look like, uh, especially around around trauma. Okay, thanks, Dan. So you mentioned at the outset that you are now involved with a violence reduction unit. Do you think that we should treat violence as a public health issue? Yes, um, and I don't think we should treat it as a health issue. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's not a medical problem, but uh, that's different from taking a public health approach to how we deal with this. Um, now, there, there isn't really a, a huge amount of difference between a public health approach and a problem solving approach. Uh, but I think the use of public health terminology does help because um, you know, in policing, everything can look like a problem. Uh, and actually, you do need to, I think, change the language slightly. Um, so that we understand that there's something different about this than, you know, every kind of incident that we get sent to can necessarily be a problem. What we're looking at is the causes of the causes, you know, those root issues that lead into further issues that lead into the things that we see. So adopting a public health approach allows us to work in those broad problem solving partnerships with an evidence base, with a trauma informed perspective and uh, you know, making a difference in, in the kind of root causes uh, as much as in the individual incidents. So I think it's important that people adopt a methodology that does that, call it what you want. Um, but uh, it, it's the kind of understanding that this isn't an incident response. This is about longer term root cause uh, uh, um, understanding and problem solving. And I, I've read some things, uh, including from Curing Violence or, or Cure Violence in the States, Gary Slutkin, um, mm. and Sandy Bloom as well has pretty much said that all violence has its origins in violence. You know, it's contagious. Mm. It's it. Um, yeah. And if you grow up in a community where it's all around you um, in your home, but also on the streets and then gang violence, very hard to escape it. Um, do you think, well, it's not a matter of do you think, but from your experience, Stan, and from, you know, working in such a wide range of policing um, areas, you know, is, is trauma often at the root of things like domestic violence, um, violent extremism, drug-related gang behaviour, from your own experience? Yes, um, it, it's not the only thing. Uh, but, you know, it, it is a feature um, and it is a way that, you know, we talk about contagion, you know, we, we can use medical terminology, but, you know, what we see are clusters. So, you know, where, where, where you have inequalities, they tend to cluster within individuals, within families, within communities and neighbourhoods. Um, and where you see, uh, you know, trauma, you often then see poor health. You often see, you know, um, you know, poverty. Uh, you know, those things they they, they attract each other. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when when you see domestic abuse, it's it's not not always rooted in trauma, but it creates trauma, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and then that can that can reproduce itself further down the line. Um, but often, yes, you you're dealing with an individual and you start to unpick some of the life history and then you can you can see you know what's happened to them mm. in their life um and that's in no way an excuse for what happens mm -hmm. uh, and i would never use um you know trauma as, a, as an excuse it's a mechanism to understand how you might want to make things different for them and for for those that may be vulnerable and for future generations it's not to say, you know, this person was traumatized and therefore we can forgive their behavior. That's mm -hmm. that's absolutely not the case. But when you see trauma, you often see other things clustering there that make people perhaps more vulnerable. Um, and often, you know, when we talk about violence being contagious, we often see 
victimization happens before mm. offending behavior. Uh, so when we're dealing with an offender, in many occasions, we can see that they were first a victim. Uh, and that's really kind of relevant when you look at adult offending, uh, because actually what's the difference between being a child and being an adult? Well, it's a day. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and when they're children, we kind of feel that actually they've suffered trauma and we need to be thinking about that. The next day, we think, well, you're now an adult and, you know, we can forget about all that trauma that you suffer. We can forget all about that therapeutic kind of approach that we're having to your vulnerability because now it's all on you. Mm. Uh, and I think we, you know, when we understand trauma and where we see it within different settings, you know, we need to figure out how we reduce vulnerability uh, to exploitation, uh, how we uh, how we uh, reach people and take them into the support that they need to live their lives differently and make healthier choices. And so, in your violence reduction unit, are are you working in partnership with a, a range of other sectors and services to improve outcomes for people? Yes. Um, so you know anybody that uh, that touches those that are just as involved. Um, you know, is a key partner for us, um, and you know, because we can we can track you know people's lives now. You know, we're all we're all a data mm -hmm. file somewhere, aren't we? We can you know start to understand what has happened to people in their life course uh, and where we might need to then uh, intervene as early as we can to provide that kind of positive support that uh, that is so needed for people that are living in and dealing with toxic stress um, and the outcome of that toxic stress in their later lives. Um, and I think just understanding that leads us into working with much a much broader partnership base than perhaps we would you know, normally work with. I'm familiar as well with the violence reduction unit in Glasgow and how they use navigators who've lived experience yep. of violence, addiction, yes. and um, sometimes knife crime themselves. And it's a very powerful yes. model to have someone um, who's really barely survived and, and done harmful yeah. things speak yeah. about positive change and being given opportunities. Stan, do you think yourself that um, peer mentors yeah. and, and and those who who dug themselves out with support from from harmful things um, have something to contribute to the criminal justice system and and, and society yeah. in general in this regard? Yeah, absolutely, um, and but it's not everyone, uh, yes. and, and and neither is it a safari. You know what we don't want to do is. Uh, you know, exploit people who've suffered trauma. Um, you know, we we need to identify the, the right people that have you know the the capacity uh, to do this. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm very aware I'm I'm, a, I'm an old white guy, you know, and a, and a police officer. You know, I if I walk into a room, you know, that I drag all that with me. You know, <laughs> so you know my ability to reach some people um, is limited by that. And I and I get that. So we need to work with others who have got the uh, the the wherewithal to be able to reach people that we need to reach. And you often hear, you know, about hard to reach groups. Well, they're kind of more easy to ignore than they are hard to reach. Mm. You know, I've never particularly found it's difficult to reach people. Um, you know, if you get out there and start speaking to them, often they cluster around you. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not necessarily hard to reach, but it's just that we find it easy to ignore them. So, yeah, you know, we need to identify where where the kind of champions are that we can rally to to do some of the connection that we as you know, yeah, people like me um, mm -hmm. would find it difficult to do, but uh, but to do that without exploiting them as well. You know, it needs to be with and for our communities, um, and we need to be there to be to provide the connectivity and support that communities need not to tell them what we think they need to do to improve you know that's that's not our role mm -hmm. uh, so you know the concept of self-healing and trauma-informed communities is a key concept uh, that that we uh, try and promote 
I'm delighted that you mentioned that because that brings <laughs> me nicely to asking you about this project that I heard you speak about at the uh, Law Enforcement and Public Health Conference last year in Edinburgh. Yeah. You were part of a panel with um, folks from Public Health England and I think there were a few other community partners as well. But it's a project in Reading that has a real mm -hmm. wide community focus and yeah. interagency um, focus where you, you kind of pool resources, isn't that correct? Or it's quite a different model anyway. You, you, maybe you, you remind me what exactly it is, Dan, <laughs> please. Well, this, this kind of stems from my time as the commander, uh, police commander in Reading, uh, which was about five years ago now I started there. Um, and we we started to build you know these structures uh, and you know, we called it joining the dots um, because it was quite clear that we needed to join the dots between policing health social care employment housing you know benefits finance etc we needed to join all those things up because you know the people that we were meeting had you know a range of complex needs so we identified, I mean, Reading's a great place. It's really vibrant. It's really multicultural. It's really connected as well. Um, so it was pretty easy in one regard to identify those folks that we could work with. Um, the difficulty was gaining their trust. Um, and in, uh, in an environment where, um, you know, finances are tight, being able to um, set up systems where people were happy to, work with each other um, because often budgets came with real strict guidelines about how they could use be used so you know it was difficult to to form some of those partnerships because they weren't funded to do this work so we had to go back into kind of commissioning and 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 it just grew and grew and grew mm -hmm. until we got to the point where we actually had something that looked like a, a, a place-based multi-agency organization and we called it One Reading. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, there's a there's a One Reading conference coming up uh, in the next few days to uh, to answer some questions around you know, trauma informed practice and how trauma informed communities can can be supported and support the activities of uh, of statutory organisations, but 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 mostly of communities themselves. So I'm pleased to see it's still running, it's still working, uh, but it's the model that we then took into the violence reduction unit to say, mm -hmm. so how do we recreate this in other places across Thames Valley? How do we get this broad partnership working together to develop um, you know, an, an, an ecosystem, if you will, of joined up support? Um, and uh, and at its heart, a trauma-informed one that was rooted in the community. So you know that effort continues, and uh, I'm pleased to see we are making some success there. Um, yeah, it's, but it's, it's amazing. Uh, it, yeah, it's going it, well. And and Sam, was it was it police-led originally the One Reading program, or or was it in in conjunction with Public Health England, or how did that work? Because I can imagine some people would be a bit suspicious, all right, if it, if it was police led, although I think fair dues uh, to, to anyone for just trying to start these interagency things, because they can always be a bit delicate and, yeah. um, but again, relationship based, essentially. Yeah, completely. Well, you know, we started it, you know, it was, it was a police led <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Um, you know, we started talking about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. We started talking about joining up the dots. Um, we started to look at, from a neighbourhood policing kind of paradigm, you know, how we could deliver some of those pillars of neighbourhood policing. Um, and, you know, it, it, was, it was a lot of hard work. But other people, you know, when we, when we developed relationships with, with other people, they began to throw into it and you know we could then just kind of relax and take a step back and think right this is now running you know people have picked this up and we need to commit to it we need to be part of it but it it now doesn't need to be police-led and the the ambition is that it becomes you know, fully community-led yeah. um and and you know there are great community organizations um out there that have the 
both the capacity and the capability to do it, but they need support. Um, you know, it's not something they can do themselves. So that continues to be the ambition. And, you know, to a degree, it's still somewhat police led mm-hmm. um, because we are there at the birth of ACES. You know, this is the, the thing to remember. You know, I said at the top of this interview that, you know, we're not just there for law enforcement, but when, when we are called uh, to incidents, you know, we're called to childhood abuse and neglect, you know, we're called to bereavement, you know, mm-hmm. police officers will attend a sudden death, they will, you know, interview people there, they will do an investigation on behalf of the coroner, you know, they, they will create some ACEs themselves, you know, they'll arrest people and take them out of the family, you know, so we're, we're there at the very start of all of this. Uh, and you know, in, in some degree you can, can contribute to it. Um, so, you know, we are in a great place to be able to coordinate that activity. We're out there on the streets and in homes in a way that many other uh, statutory agencies are, are not. Um, and we can do it in times of increased stress and increased risk as well, because we're trained and equipped to do that. So, you know, it, the police are a you know a, a, a great you know mechanism to drive this kind of change and to pull other people into this organisational change. We're not the experts, and we can't fix many of the things that we see, and that's why we need to draw in experts and people that can actually do the fixing. Uh, but we're in a great place to coordinate that activity. Yeah, no, I, I must say I think it's very very visionary that you. Um you started this and you're you're right because no one agency can do it all on their own just like there are limits to trauma-informed care or trauma-informed treatment modalities that are only targeting individuals or even targeting families because some communities as we said earlier have a lot of aces and trauma from household to household so hence the community-wide focus is is really really important and I'm becoming more and more interested in this over the last kind of year about what can communities do you know the ordinary men and women and grannies and granddads and teachers and police and GPs and whoever else is part of a community what can we all do to support and buffer one another more because we often are so busy in our day-to-day lives that it's it's enough to just focus on ourselves yeah but because yeah. we need one another to be healthy yeah. Yeah. and functioning, um, we kind of need to know, I think, that we can play a role in a, a, tr- a troublesome teenager's life or in a yeah. struggling single parent. So in the One Reading uh, project or now as part of the Violence Reduction Unit in Thames Valley, are you looking at... The, the community dimension itself so yes building the community partnerships Dan. yes uh, so we have a big you know resilience builder program um, that is kind of rooted in community problem solving um, because you're right you know communities can can solve this um, but they're up against it when you re- when you look at some of the issues that communities are dealing with you know that takes all of their energy mm-hmm. Uh, and you know sometimes just you know putting food on the table you know consumes all of your energy um so how do you have time for all the other stuff that's going on in the world and and that just lands on you probably at the worst possible time um and you know we we need to build some resilience into communities so that they don't have to just figure out how to live mm-hmm. from minute to minute that they've got some capacity to invest in 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 relationships and in other things um and that's the key is you know making sure that people are just not in constant fight flight and survival mode mm-hmm. um and then you can start to build you know the the communities um, and that's the role for statutory services is to provide that space for communities to flourish. Mm. Uh, and, you know, it's a great sadness of mine that I kind of look across areas and I see enduring, uh, you know, pockets of poverty and inequality. And I think, you know, wh- why, you know, why, why in 2020, you know, do, do we see areas uh, of the country that are steeped in poverty and inequality? You know, why? Yeah, there, there is indeed. there is there is no answer to that yeah. um other than because we didn't do anything about it yeah 
uh, because we have the wherewithal to do something about it. Um, and, uh, you know, we're not going to do that unless we join forces um, and join the dots and start to uh, enable, enables a, the wrong word really, it start to provide the kind of support that communities need to, to develop and flourish. Um, I'm a big fan as well of Dr. Wendy Ellis um, and the building community resilience model in the yep. States um, because yep. she brings together or the, the team bring together the adverse community environment conditions yeah. that we're kind of talking about there, the food yep. insecurity, unstable housing or unaffordable rubbishy quality housing, community violence. Um, inability to move up the social ladder and then yes. the family and individual stuff happens within that wider environmental yeah. context but yep. Wendy is also um, very keen to promote in the states racial equity as well um, yes. as, as a policeman working in the UK do you think um, uh, racism and the stress that people feel in their bodies around white bodies due to, you know, discrimination and this type of thing. And even, you know, how policing disproportionately maybe affects uh, some communities. Do you think there's work to be done on that issue in, in the UK as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I, you know, all of these things have a ratchet effect on you know the way that you can live a, a healthy life uh, and you know covid has kind of really illustrated uh, the disproportionality that's out there now you kind of change the word uh, covid for practically anything else and it's the mm -hmm. same right you know health inequalities you know existed before covid uh, wealth inequalities existed before covid uh, you know policing uh, was disproportionately felt, and you know, many say they feel over policed and, and underprotected. Was disproportionately felt, and uh, in areas uh, where you had, you know, um, you know, high racial uh, disparities. And the, you know, it's no surprise, really. You know, the criminal law is there to produce a benchmark for what we might want to call typical behaviour. Uh, and it's written by largely by people that look like me, frankly. Yeah. Um, they don't sound like me, but <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so you know you have this criminal law, which is the benchmark, and then you have the criminal justice system that punishes people who don't behave in that way. Mm. And you think, well, what things make people not behave in that way? Well, you know, many criminologists would probably go down the road the road of, you know, uh, the kind of rational choice or whatever else. Um, but when you start examining things like ACEs and the impact it has on uh, on your choices, um, then you start to understand that people behave in non-typical ways for lots of different reasons. Uh, and within that is, you know, issues of race, issues of neurodevelopmental differences. Um, and then when you start to say, well, does this does this disparity between what's typical and what's not typical? lead into our prison population. So when you start doing the same analyses on your prison population, and you could tell me a bit more about this than I know, Jane, but you start to see the prevalence of neuro disabilities and neurodevelopmental disorders and neurodiversity within those people that we would lock up. So, uh, yeah, and racial differences, of course. So, you know, the, you know, the, the, everything's interlinked and anything that causes you to behave in a way that is not seen as typical by the criminal law, you know, leads you closer into being involved with justice services. So, yeah, race is important. Poverty is important. Often they're linked. Health is important. Often they're linked as well. Mm -hmm. You know, violence is important and, and often that's linked to the other. So, you know, mm -hmm. You have to understand the root causes. You have to look at who is falling foul of the law. And you have to ask yourself really deep uh, questions about why is that the case? And the answer is never because they're bad. Mm -hmm. The uh, the answer is is always rooted somewhere else. And, and 
you know, it's soft justice if we just take the easy answer to say, lock them up. Mm. Um, you know, that's that's uh, soft justice. The hard uh, policing effort is always on uh, is always on prevention, and uh, in order to do that, we need to understand how people live their lives differently to those that might want to um, to punish them. Yeah, beautifully said, uh, Stan. Um, final question then, given that everything is interlinked and uh, we need to understand the complexity of causes and try and prevent poverty and trauma and racism and, and everything else we've discussed, what areas of public policy in the UK do you believe are most in need of change? Uh, Short-term funding. Yeah, I think um, is uh, is an area uh, that we need to start looking at longer term uh, programs. We need to start looking at how we join uh, people together in those programs. So, kind of single agency funding is you know we need to look at shared outcomes, joint outcomes. Um, we need to look at outcomes and not outputs. Much funding mm -hmm. is based on a kind of resourcing model and actually needs to be based on more of an outcome model. And, um, you know, our, our government, similar to all governments around the world, I'm sure, needs to think about how it joins up its departments more effectively. Um, because I hear often, you know, how do you, how can you join up with other agencies? And it's like, well, I wouldn't have to if you were joined up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the, the so, you know, a more kind of cross-governmental, interdepartmental, you know, cross-disciplinary, whatever you want to call it, but a more joined up approach uh, that understands that, you know, people fall into ill health often because they've been victims of, you know, uh, abuse and neglect, and we can do something about that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the doctors that treat them for their, you know, non-specific pain condition can't, you know. So uh, in a kind of policy sense, longer term, more joined up funding with a clearer understanding of the links that happen across a life course and within societies and therefore a more joined up uh, approach to commissioning that is more about shared outcomes. And kind of lastly, I guess, much more uh, community development. Um, we often over professionalize the systems you know, we'll identify a problem and we'll think how, you know, we as statutory agencies perhaps can can deal with that problem. Mm -hmm. And we over-professionalize, we create a pathway, you know, and it's all well-meaning and often it works, but it does tend to over-professionalize some things where actually if we invested a bit more in the community uh, to give them the space that we discussed earlier, perhaps we wouldn't have to professionalize those pathways because they would, you know, the, 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 uh, the support would be landing where it needs to land in the right way. Yeah, that's, that's a really great point. All of those were, were um, very much close to my own heart, dismantling the silos and whole of government approaches, but also in terms of the community, you used the word safari earlier and Darren McGarvey, um, his book called Poverty Safari, one of the really interesting yep. bits is about middle class kind of saviors parachuting into underprivileged <laughs> communities. And yes. then because of funding ramifications, it, it kind yeah. of becomes about perpetuating the organization rather than really attending to need and listening yes. to people. So I'm with you there that we need more community led by people living in the community while not do, displacing the, outside yeah, expertise. But... No, absolutely. But, you know, community organizations can be every bit as bad as anyone else when it comes to single issue, you know, because they're, they're, they're often led by somebody who has a passion and their passion is, is often uh, has often been developed within lived experience. So, you know, they're they're on a mission. Yeah. Um, and, you know, sometimes you say, well, actually, what you're doing here needs to be a bit more joined up with others and you need yeah. to. But because they are so kind of focused, you know, they're as bad as anyone. You yeah. know, there's, you know, I, I'll, I'll be on a mission for what I'm after. You'll be on a mission for what you're after. But, you know, what we have to do in this in this environment is join that up. So yeah. we can't just leave it to to people, um, you know. 
a collaborative uh, we, mission it has to be collaborative it has to be you know okay you want to get what you want done but you need to be able to negotiate that with other actors in this in similar networks and work together you can't just think that this is you know you can solve this problem because these are all wicked problems and anyone who thinks they can solve it is often part of the problem and mm -hmm. that's where you need to then start start to say we need to work together and make this you know less bad in increments mm -hmm. you know because you've got a good idea doesn't mean to say that you're going to fix all of this you know you, we need to do it in increments we need to work together superintendent stan gilmore it has been a real delight talking to you i wish there were more like you out out there and and over here i'm sure there are too but it's i'm sure a, there a are matter of spreading this word and um uh, to use the contagion metaphor, you know, infecting people with um, enthusiasm for taking a, a wider look at these really complex problems and and taking the risk as well of collaboration, because it can be uncomfortable, I think, for people at the beginning, yeah. thinking differently, learning new terminology. We like to get stuck in our ways, but really, uh, while growth is a little bit painful at times, it's also really... Um, exciting when, when yeah. things start to shift and rewarding really it's rewarding. Very, it's very rewarding but you need to let your ego go yeah uh you know i think um you know the leave your ego at the door was one of the uh was one of the discussions at the conference in edinburgh um uh from uh, the chief constable of uh of lancashire um you know, leave your ego at the door uh, and just go into a room and just be open to learning and sharing and developing together. It's not about you. <laughs> yeah. And listening really is magic. You know, if you can actually do that, leave the ego, not take yeah. things personally, just listen. Yeah. We can yeah. co-regulate and then we can can kind of identify yeah. the the shared humanity and, yeah. and we're, we're just more open to, to cooperating yeah. with one another as well. Yeah. Your ego but makes you defensive and that puts does. people off. But anyway, listen, we, we could talk about this forever. It's been lovely chatting to you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much, Stan. This has been How to Talk Policy and Influence People with me, Jane Mulcahy, and Superintendent Stan Gilmore. Um, hopefully, people might be able to tune in to that one Reading conference as well. It sounds very interesting, or maybe look back at videos or find documents. But thanks for sharing all your knowledge and insight and enthusiasm and um, vision for a different way of approaching wicked problems. Thank you, Stan. Thank you. Bye-bye.